Jerome Mayhew. Thank you very much, Mr Stringer. Um, I'm very glad to uh, lend my support to the arguments of many um, MPs whose constituencies are directly affected by the proposed pylon route of East Anglia Green. I represent the constituency of Broadland in Norfolk, which is not directly affected. The, the, the run starts at Dunstan in, Norwich, in, in South Norfolk, just south of Norwich, and then heads through Suffolk and then into Essex. But the reason why I wanted to join in this debate is to question the rationale for why you need to reinforce the transmission network from Norwich South in the first place. Because the consultation, which has um, been much criticised already, and I, I'm sure will be criticised further during the course of this debate by other contributors, starts with the assumption that there is a problem that needs to be solved. And that problem is that there's additional power being applied to the network at Dunstan at Norwich South. And this, of course, is from offshore um, wind farms, uh, both the ones which have already been uh, connected uh, in the last five years, since the last review by Ofgem in 2015, and also the, the huge number of additional wind farms which are anticipate, anticipated between now and 2030 and thereafter. We know from the National Grid ESO report of last year that there's a, an anticipation that there will be 17 gigawatts of offshore wind constructed in the Southern North Sea alone, part of the 50 gigawatts by 2030 ambition. But the problem that we have is that whilst we've won the argument for a holistic network design leading to an offshore transmission network, we've won that argument for the country and the Secretary of State has made that uh, announcement on the floor of the House. We appear to have lost the battle when it comes to East Anglia because the holistic network design comes into force from 2030 onwards, we're told, and yet the connections for East Anglia affect our counties between now and 2030. It's between now and 2030 that the 17 gigawatts is going to be constructed and connected. Right. So we have the most classic example of the cart before the horse. Well put. Much better that we look again at the design for East Anglian connection, follow the advice of National Grid ESA, its own report, which has already been referred to by the Honourable Member for South Norfolk, and create an offshore transmission network. Accelerate it. Don't accept the argument that it can only be put in place by 2030. Push for 2025. And if we do that, on their own estimates, there are six billion pounds of savings to be made. £3 billion pounds in reduced capital expenditure. It makes it much easier for wind farm to connect to uh, a grid that is already off offshore. And then £3 billion pounds of further operating savings between now and 2050. So, I will, with pleasure. Is he, uh, does he not share my concern that with this enormous extra offshore capacity that is coming, if we don't follow his suggestion, which is government policy to have an offshore grid, as soon as possible, we could even be faced with the nightmare that we're currently faced with being duplicated or triplicated because in a few years' time, they'll turn around and say, well, actually, the pylons we've just installed a few years ago aren't sufficient, so we need even more pylons. How lunatic would that be? Well, I'm grateful for the, for the intervention. Of course, uh, Ofgem would say, well, we've done the calculations. We know that there isn't going to be any more offshore wind, and we've, we, we think this is going to be enough. But you have to look at what they said in 2015 when they last looked at this subject and they were asked to assess whether an offshore transmission network uh, um, amounted to value for money for the consumer. And their advice to government was no, it's not, because we'll never have enough offshore wind to justify it. Well, how wrong they were. Yeah. Just six yeah. years later, yeah. Yeah. here we are bitterly ruining that short-sighted failure to make anticipatory infrastructure decisions when we could have saved all these arguments and be leading Europe in the development of this innovative uh, design, which now is absolutely technically possible. In fact, I've spoken uh, with others to the managing director of Hitachi, who tells us that this is off-the-shelf technology now. Absolutely. So we come back to the consultation which has just been closed and the, the position of the regulators and, uh, and national grid. And if I could encapsulate their arguments, it's worse to the effect of it is too late to change the decision in relation to connection points. They're saying, 
We are where we are. We have these radial connections coming into uh, Norfolk. And given that the, the power is being delivered to South Norfolk, we therefore have to reinforce the network to draw the electricity south. Hence, East Anglia Green and 112 miles of pylons. However, I invite the Minister to take a step back and look at the rationale behind the decision of the, uh, the contracts written to allow the offshore wind farms to connect to Norwich South. Because all of those, all of those offers must have been subject to planning yeah, permission. Yeah, yeah. Because the regulator knew, or ought to have known, that the connection point did not have sufficient capacity to deal with the anticipated Yes, I won't away. Well, the, the anticipated measures. Well, Fred is making an excellent and highly technical but very important speech. Is it not true that in our recent discussions with, uh, with Ofgem, uh, National Grid and others, officials from Bayes actually confirmed on the call that none of the current contracts could in any way predetermine the planning application, and that therefore the question of how the electricity is ultimately shifted through the onshore grid is still open? Yeah. The Honourable Member for South Suffolk is absolutely right. But as, so as a question of law, this must be open because it's subject to planning. So this gives the Minister a great opportunity here not to create the same errors that we made in 2015, to be bold about the anticipatory infrastructure that is required that is being implemented in, for the holistic network design elsewhere in the country. The only part of the country which is not part, ironically, of the holistic network design is East Anglia, when it was East Anglian MPs who pushed the government into adopting the policy. So we have an opportunity here to create the infrastructure that will allow us to connect without more devastating environmental impacts on our environment, but also on our communities, to save money in the medium term, as uh, pointed out by National Grid ESO themselves in their own position paper, and to accelerate the early adoption of additional wind farms because the connection process will, once the offshore transmission network is in place, it's actually quicker, quicker and easier. And additionally, if we take that uh, offshore route via Sea Link 2 down to the Isle of Grain, then it will have additional potential benefits in relation to international interconnectors as well. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I question the rationale behind the assumptions that went into the consultation paper. And I make this one further request. In the very constructive call that we had, a number of us had, uh, with National Grid uh, ETO yesterday, they committed to generating a like-for-like -like offshore replacement for East Anglia Green. But I have one concern about that. That is, if you literally Absolutely. do a like-for-like -like comparison, yep. then what you would be doing is taking energy from Norwich South and delivering it to Tilbury. That is not the question that should be asked. The it's question should be on. asked is, what is the cost of taking advantage of an offshore route right. to deliver electricity to the greater London area? Not an exact like-for-like -like comparison of South Norfolk to uh, to Dunstan to Tilbury. How do we take advantage of the benefits which National Grid ESO themselves identified in their position paper to maximise the dynamism of our electricity provision whilst minimising the cost both to the taxpayer and to the constituents of our three counters? Yeah. Yeah.